Hello everyone and welcome back to my KSP tutorial series in Kerbal Space Program 0.90 Beta. In this episode, I think I'm going to go for something a little bit more ambitious. I think it's about time we did some interplanetary transfers. Now, interplanetary transfers would be relatively easy for me if I had maneuver nodes, if I had uh, the patch conics unlocked, but I don't. And so, uh, actually patch conics in particular I would actually consider essential but I'm going to try doing it without those. Let me quickly take a look at how much it's going to cost to upgrade Mission Control because if I take both the Duna and Ike contract, Ike is the moon of Duna, and so it'd be convenient to have both of them, but I, I might want to take both of them, And but I, right now I have max active contracts too. I think I'm going to need to upgrade that. So yeah, I'm going to upgrade that at, at the 64,000 fun cost which will allow me to have seven contracts so that even if I pick up both the Duna and Ike contract, I'm not going to be uh, unable to do other contracts if for some reason these take longer than I think they will. Okay, so, but that's our focus this time. We're going to try and do what we can around Ike and Duna. And let's start off by trying to send one of our uh, previously built probes uh, to make a point. I want to see if uh, one of the probes that was meant for the moon uh, could get all the way over to Duna. So this is Moon Explorer 1. It comes in at just under 18 tons. We now have a capacity of 140 tons, but we don't have that many parts to work with. And what I want to do perhaps is maybe add another stage in instead of having just two stages. Uh, that would be... Uh, Interesting thing, though I could launch it as is, I suppose. Seems to cost more than it wasn't. No, okay, that's how much it costs. All right, um, so thirteen thousand two hundred and eighty-five. Um, hold on a sec. Let me uh, calculate delta v for this and see if maybe I can do something better. Okay, so I've made a few changes, but I've tried to keep it under the eighteen ton thirty part limit. Well, obviously I have to put it, keep it under the thirty part limit, but I've deliberately kept it under the 18 ton limit in order to demonstrate that it is possible with that limit in place. And uh, But I've rebuilt it into a three-stage vehicle so that this is now the uh, Rockmax 48-7S and this is the LV-909. And so altogether it has about, I think, 7,600 meters per second of delta V as opposed to the previous version or the original uh, uh, Moon Express 1, I think it was. Moon Express 1, yeah. Um, that one had 6,400 meters per second worth of delta V. But uh, the reason, one of the reasons this has much more is because I've turned it, instead of a, making a lander, it's going to be a flyby mission. And so it doesn't need the lander legs. That's the main thing that I've removed here. And so you'll notice that. Otherwise, uh, pretty straightforward. I don't intend to bring this back this time. Though it has a lot of delta V, I think I might need that delta V for corrections because I don't have the maneuver node system and there's a lot that can go wrong. So I've given myself a lot of extra delta V to make sure that I can get this mission successful and uh, so that things don't go awry, like staging. <clears throat> Fixing that here. Alright, so other than that we're at the three part limit so I can't really slap on too much more than this. So let's get it, well, let's not get it going. We need to uh, figure something out first. So let's save this and go to the tracking station. Now I've already uh, told you about phase angles. And so what we need is the right phase angle between Kerbin and Duna to transfer to Duna. I'm not gonna do the calculation here. If you remember, the, the key component of the phase angle is R1 plus R2, that's the radius between the sun and Kerbin plus the radius between the Sun and Duna. You could look that up or you can just use this altitude here. Uh, the orbits are circular enough that that should be fine and I don't think the, the diameter of the Sun is particularly large so you can just use that altitude and so it'll be uh, 13 billion meters, 13.338 uh, million kilometers plus 21 Point three one three million kilometers divided by two times this radius so it'll be uh, 42.626 million kilometers so that division take that to the 1.5 power 
1 minus that and then 180 times that and just look back at the episode where I explained that if you didn't get that equation down and what you'll find is that we have to transfer at an angle of 44.36 degrees. The beautiful thing is since the planetary orbits don't change very much, um, very little at all, once you've calculated it you don't have to do it again. So uh, but uh, you have, do have to calculate it the first time or you can look up a reference but uh, of course uh, there are many different uh, modifications to the Kerbin system that you can get from mods so for instance you can get all sorts of wacky planetary systems and you should know how to calculate the phase angle between any planets that you might encounter as long as they have circular orbits right so ELU is a little bit tricky but it's not too far off as long as it's not a comet, uh, the phase angle calculation isn't going to put you too far off the right timing. But in any case, the answer is 44.36 degrees. So right now we're more like 90 degrees. You can see it's more like a 90 degree angle between Kerbin and Duna. Let's get to the right uh, angle before we move on. And of course, since Kerbin is on the inside track, it's going to go faster, so it's catching up to Duna. And that looks like about 45 degrees. By the way, uh, it so happens that the orbits between Kerbin and Duna are roughly, roughly the same uh, same gap as that between Earth and Mars. And since really the the whole point of the phase angle calculation is just a gap between the two orbits, uh, the angle between Earth and Mars to transfer is the roughly the same as the angle between Kerbin and Duna. Uh, it's roughly because the the orbits in real life with Earth and Mars aren't perfectly circular, they have more inclination and stuff like that so that's a little bit more complicated and that throws off the timing somewhat but anyway uh, a convenient thing to note if you ever uh, want to take a look at real solar system which modifies the system to be our real solar system uh, the transfer phase angle between Earth and Mars is the same it's good enough to go with that all right, so now let us launch because now we are at the right timing. It would have, the rocket would have been waiting on the launch pad for days if we had tried to go launch first or in space for days. Okay, okay, here we go. The staging is still a little bit off, but that is corrected. SAS on, throttle up. And all right, first mission to Duna. Let's see if it works. Now obviously if you uh, send a mission to Duna, get all the way there and it fails, you're going to have to wait quite a long time before sending another mission because you have to get the planets in alignment again. So you could be waiting like uh, 200 days. Uh, it, actually that is a little bit more complicated depending on whether you have Earth days or Kerbin days configured here. I use Earth days because I've already calculated a lot of stuff based on that. So just for you to know, I use Earth day days. That wasn't really important until we start doing interplanetary transfers. But now that we're doing that, uh, you need to know that I'm using Earth days. So the next, uh, the, the real troublesome part is going to be ejection angle. And that is where to start your burn. Where to start your burn to go to Duna. And that is going to be uh, something that I'm not going to calculate. I'm going to try it out. I'm going to give you the principles of uh, how to figure it out. And uh, we'll work from there. There's a calculation for everything. But it's not necessary to always calculate everything. We'll see. Uh, once you get the maneuver node system, uh, calculating ejection angle is completely unnecessary. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm not entirely... I don't think it's entirely important to get that down. The maneuver node system would not help you figure out phase angles. So so I'm going to see how the margins work on this mission. It's possible to uh, create a Duna lander or even a uh, Duna lander or Ike lander, not both mind you, just one or the other, with an uh, 18 ton craft and we'll see about that. It'll certainly save us the costs but one thing at a time. This way I'll get to assess some... because uh, I've never done this without maneuver nodes so I need to figure out what I need as a buffer in order to do this right. 
This stage is a bit underpowered. We're not at a TWR of 1 yet. This LV-909 stage only had a 1500 Delta V in it. Could have just dumped it. Might have been a better idea. Now, when getting into orbit for an interplanetary transfer, it is helpful to be as low around Kerbin as possible. So I'm going to keep it to 75 kilometers on the apoapsis side. I'm going to do a little bit more of a burn to lift my periapsis. And then we'll talk about transferring. Okay, that's fine by me. All right, so we are now in orbit. And let's go back to this view and zooming out. What we need to do is, if you remember how the Holman uh, transfer diagram worked, uh, we need to be going in the direction that Kerbin is going right now. See, we're going to get a boost from Kerbin's own orbital velocity, which is all in this direction. And in doing so, we're going to have that boost going into Duna. And on the other side, we're going to be uh, uh, going in the direction of Duna's orbital velocity. And so that will minimize the adjustments we need to make. That's the whole goal of the Hohmann transfer. So on this side, we are going along with uh, Kerbin's orbital velocity. And on the other side, we're also going to be going along with Duna's orbital velocity. Okay, so when we uh, do our burn to leave Kerbin, we need to make sure that we do the burn in such a way as our new velocity vector, our trajectory out, is going to be matching this orbit. Now, if we were going to EVE, we would want to go in the opposite direction, so against Kerbin's orbit, but that uh, it's still fine. Uh, I, I don't know exactly how to explain the math, but, but yeah, uh, you just uh, make sure that your outward trajectory matches Kerbin's orbit either way, but you're going to want to match it going down when going to the inner planets, and up when going to the outer planets. Okay, and so the question is, where exactly do we start the burn in order to make this happen? And from experience, I would say around here, but it's purely from experience. So if, uh, if Kerbin's orbit is 12 o'clock, so this direction is 12 o'clock, then typically I would start to burn at, at around 5 o'clock. Okay, so the place on your orbit that you would need to burn in order to get a proper escape from Kerbin in order to reach any planet you like is called the ejection angle. And the ejection angle is measured from, from the direction of Kerbin's orbit. So we, we say that this is 12 o'clock. Well, that's zero degrees. And you go around the clock. And so... There is a tool to figure this out. So for arrow breaking, there's a KSP arrow breaking calculator. For this, there is a KSP launch window calculator or something like that. And so it can help you out if you don't want to try and figure out all the calculations. But the basic idea is that around 5 o'clock is the right place for me. Uh, I think the ejection angle should be around 140 degrees or something like that. So we're going to be starting to burn pretty soon. I actually think I'm going to let it go another orbit while I explain at least one more thing. But uh, maybe we'll get to that through that quickly enough. So there's two things that are going on here. Let's see. Yes, okay. Uh, first, we need to escape. And so the velocity for escape is the square root of 2 times our current velocity in orbit, assuming we're in a circular orbit, which in this case is 2284.4. And so if we bring up a calculator, 2284.4 uh, times the square root of 2, I'm just going to use the approximation 1.414. Okay, uh, so we expect uh, to need to go 3230 to escape Kerbin's gravity. Okay, and if we subtract our current speed, about 946 meters per second. Okay, so that's what we need to escape. And then there is the calculation to transfer from Kerbin to Duna, which I explained in a previous episode. Uh, again, you're going to be using the altitudes to figure out how to calculate the delta V for that. And it's based on the orbital speeds of the two 
parties. But I'm not going to go through that again. Uh, the fact is, actually, it doesn't take much more than 946 if you do the burns at the same time. If you try to escape Kerbin first, and then only after escaping Kerbin do the burn for Duna, it's going to take longer. Um, so, yeah, that's about the size of it. I'm going to try and do the burns together. But I don't know what it's going to show me in terms of my orbit. So here we go. I might be a little bit early, might be a little bit late. Not entirely sure. We need at least 3,200 uh, meters per second. We know that. Now it will show me an escape trajectory once I reach that. What it won't show me is what my orbit towards Duna looks like. So I might have to make an adjustment once we get out into interplanetary space. So was it 3,230 it said? I think we're probably at escape already. Yeah, it's got us on escape trajectory. Now, what we wanted to do was have our this outgoing, see this is our outgoing trajectory here. We need that to line up with our uh, the trajectory of Kerbin. So let's keep burning here. And you'll see that it starts going closer and closer to Kerbin's own trajectory. Uh, it fades out though, annoyingly enough. Try and cite that. Okay, right about there we're matching, let's see, if we can see both of them at the same time it'd be nice. There we go, um, not quite. Okay, let's burn a little bit more in this direction. So, once you've re reached escape trajectory, basically all of the speed that it took to reach escape uh, trajectory gets lost. Uh, you have escaped Kerbin's gravity. Once you get around the sun, none of that gravity counts. Let's let's take a look at that. Not, none of that speed counts, I mean. None of the energy that you expended to get to that point matters. Hold on, we're losing battery power. Let's make sure... Oh, that is because Kerbin is blocking the sun. Okay. So you can see our velocity bleeding off here. But there is excess velocity, right? We, we didn't just reach escape velocity. We reached escape velocity plus some additional delta V, if you'd like. And so we're going to carry that extra amount of velocity with us. But we're not going to... When is it going to toss me out into interplanetary space? Come on. Are we there yet? Nope. Should be focused on this anyway. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we've got some additional velocity, and it looks like we've overshot Duna. Um, but basically, if you just reach escape velocity, you're going to have an orbit that's almost matching Kerbin's. Uh, it's like you had not done anything at all. Uh, you have escaped Kerbin's velocity, but you're going in exactly the same orbit that you had been around the sun. Uh, in other words, if you had been landed on Kerbin, you would have been going in this orbit. And if you reach escape velocity and just reach escape velocity, you're going to be going in this orbit as well. We've added some additional delta V to our orbit. And in fact, too much. So let me pull this back down. It's too much only if we've done a perfect Hohmann transfer, though. And that's tricky to determine at this point. But I'm going to assume that we've done a good Hohmann transfer, in which case I need to touch Duna's orbit like this. Okay. Well, now let's find out. Um, I don't know whether we've done a good enough transfer or not. Uh, the key would have been getting the ejection angle exactly right. I don't have too many instruments on this, do I? Some, we'll just observe a mystery goo here. Um, you know, I want to save... 
no, let's have some confidence for now. Once, if we miss Duna and Ike, then that's one thing. But for now, let's let's see if we can get over to Duna and Ike. All right, let's head out and make sure we're oriented well. Probably the thing to do is orient north south here. No, no. Well, no, that's good enough. Now there is an inclination difference with Duna, but we have no idea what that is right now. So I don't know how close or far off from Duna I'm getting. Well, I could take a look. Let's let's sight it out. Looks like we're a little bit low, right? So if I go down at this end, seems to make it worse. Okay. So let's say I go up at this end. That makes it better. Or am I looking at it the wrong way? Let's see. No, that's that's okay. All right, I think we've corrected inclination. All right, let's continue. Now remember, once we get to Duna, there's also the part where we need to match orbits with Duna, which means lifting this up to Duna's orbit, right? So that's the second part of all this. You can see we have to get very, very close to Duna in order to get that uh, encounter. And I don't know if we've really gotten it. I don't think we have. It's going too fast. Darn. I think we need to speed up. I don't know if it'll work or not, but let me try. So we actually got to speed up by going retrograde, which means pulling our periapsis down. Or is that right? That's right. So what we're looking at is... See how the apoapsis is coming in? Okay, this is probably... Well, uh, this is probably not going to work. Okay, so that was a near miss. It looks like I, I really need a lot more. Let's see how far off we end up being. i got to be persistent about this. Uh, there's no penalty to taking your time. You know what I should have done? When we got close to Duna, I should have lifted my orbit to match Duna's orbit. It would have been horribly wasteful, but it would have been the best thing to do. Uh, if I had lifted my orbit to match Duna's orbit, uh, then we would have uh, we would have been just able to fine tune our our progress to Duna. Right now, we're so far off; it's uh, it's quite horrible. <laughs> so uh, I'll go around one more time and see if we can get closer, and then I'll try to lift my orbit. I think I've got enough delta v for that. Generally, when you approach Duna, you don't want to manually match Duna's orbit. What you can do is use Duna's atmosphere. Duna has a thin atmosphere, and you can use its atmosphere to, at that point, you need to slow down and, with respect to Duna. Duna will pull you in, basically. And as long as it's got an atmosphere, it can help you do that. So that's usually the plan for Duna. And, uh, but I don't think we've got to be able to make use of that plan this time very much. Okay, so I'll see if we can get into some sort of close close proximity to Duna and then match orbits. So at Apoapsis, I'm going to uh, boost my orbit up, but not all the way. wonder if I really have the delta V for this sort of thing. I think I do. This is what I made the margin for, so... I want to make sure I had the best chance possible even if I missed Duna on the first pass because again I, I haven't done this before I haven't done this without maneuver nodes I wonder if that'll be enough okay let's see oh let's orient uh, north south again so at this point it's once again a lot like rendezvousing with any particular target except it takes a lot longer 
<laughs> that's that's the rub here. Uh, obviously, you do not want to do all this, and with maneuver node, there's no particular reason you should be. This is not something that anybody likes to see having happen. So Duna has a sphere of influence. All the all gravitating bodies have a sphere of influence. And so you can calculate that and see how close you need to get in order to actually get captured by him. We're going to go past Duna's orbit for part of this. Hopefully it'll be able to catch up to us and grab us. With planets, the sphere of influence is relatively small compared to their whole orbit, unlike the moon or Minmus. The moon and Minmus are easier to rendezvous with because their sphere of influence is large compared to their orbits. So, now we have a practically matching orbit with Duna. Uh, we're a little bit closer into the sun on one side, a little bit further out on the other side, but we're a little bit ahead. So I'm going to go a little bit further than this. And hopefully now we're just a little bit slower than Duna. Let's see. This is going to take a while. You know what? I think I'm going to lift this side even more than it is. If we get a good chunk of this mission completed, though, I swear I'm going to unlock those uh, patch conics at least. Now, it might be a little bit confusing that you're actually speeding up to slow down. In other words, you're lifting your orbit to a higher orbit, and the net result is actually that you're going slower. But the higher orbit is the one with more energy, because you are getting away from the sun, the sun's gravitational influence. You're higher up the well. And so, because you're higher up the well, that is why... Uh, and of course, you're losing that uh, velocity. If you eventually escaped the sun, uh, you would lose that velocity. And you would be then orbiting around the galactic center in exactly the same orbit that the sun orbits around the galactic center. Such is the way of things. Honestly, this is a lot harder than I thought it would be. Trying to move my orbit down a bit. This is a radial burn to do that. There we go. Now, frankly speaking, if you really want to make your first interplanetary transfer and get the whole swing of things down, even without maneuver nodes or patch conics or anything like that, you could probably hit Jewel pretty easily. Jules got this huge sphere of influence, and you don't have to do these fine-tuning things that I'm having to do here and might not even work. Jewel will bring you in. Uh, as long as you've got the right phase angle, the phase angle for a Jewel from uh, Kerbin is 96.58. So uh, it'll take about 2,000 meters per second of delta V to get there. That'll be your burn. Uh, so you're talking about an excess of more than 1,100 meters per second. Um, Something of that order. In fact, this craft could probably have gotten all the way out to Jewel, uh, given that Jewel will be sure to help it out by sucking it in. So, we could try that if we get a contract for it, too. I'll remember to bring this vessel up. It's cheap, at least. By the way, it's worth mentioning that outer planets tend to have much larger spheres of influence than inner planets. Uh, the sphere of influence calculation depends on how close the orbiting thing is to the central body. So the closer it is into the sun, or the closer a particular moon is to, say, Jewel. Jewel has four moons, and so the closer that those moons are to Jewel, the smaller the sphere of influence. Though it depends also on their own gravity. So basically I'm going to keep trying to hit Duna. It is the weekend by the way, otherwise I wouldn't be taking this kind of time. I'm going to keep trying to hit Duna until I run out of fuel. Once I run out of fuel I'm going to do the experiment in interplanetary space and just transmit that. But for now, I'm just getting closer and closer. 
Oh my, what's the time limit on? Well, these shouldn't have a time limit, actually. These explore contracts, I don't think they have time limits. I think they're up to whenever. Okay. Just to give you an idea how close things are right now. It's uh, quite a thing, Duna. Quite a thing. Oh, for crap's sake, that's close. <laughs> I mean, wow. Okay, come on. I have to pay very close attention, and now I've disappeared. Because uh, uh, once we get into Duna's sphere of influence, it's not going to take very long for the transition between SOIs to take place and. Uh, what you got? Uh, we we we'll, we'll have less than a, well, we might have a day or so in Duna Sphere of Influence. So if I'm time warping through that, that could be bad. It's so close, I can't fine tune anything right now. Am I slower or faster? I've got an inclination problem. Okay, this looks like a good place to fix inclination. All right, let's point north. should take care of it. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Oh, I think I'm gonna cry. <laughs> We've made it, and our orbit was so close to Duna's orbit that not only did Duna capture us, it's actually brought us into orbit already. <laughs> That's quite impressive. Oh, wow. All right. We are in Duna orbit. Hello? Okay, well, we, we might need to get into a tighter orbit than this for it to be satisfied. Um, which way around are we going? Okay, we're going in. I feel like it's going to spit me out again. You know how that happens. We're very obviously very close to escape velocity here. So could happen, but I'm gonna wait until we get as close as possible before uh pulling ourselves in a bit. Then we'll go around again and then pull the periapsis in. And I'm gonna try and hit Ike's orbit with the periapsis. We don't have much fuel left, but we've got a healthy amount of delta V there. There, is that orbit enough for you? Yes, okay. Well, without further ado, let's do a goo container. Okay, and we will transmit that data. Excellent work. Uh, let, let me hold off on the, on the Science Junior for a sec. Let us try and hit Ike's orbit now. So I'm gonna go around to Apoapsis. So I think we got, uh, yep, we got some funds now, and that means we can finally unlock those patch conics, which will make this a lot easier next time. Okay. Now it might take a while to hit uh, Ike's orbit, but not as long as it took uh, to get into Duna's, because Ike has a huge sphere of influence. This looks like a good pass. We are at a inclination with Ike, though, so that might make it difficult for Ike. Yeah, I think it's making it difficult for... Oh, no. Ike's got us. See, that's how it's supposed to work. <laughs> All right, does that count as orbit around Ike? Not yet, because we're too close to to escape. Okay. Okay, that's achieving orbit around Ike. Got a trivial amount of fuel left. Let's do some science. 
Okay, transmit that data. Yep. Let's attempt to escape out to Tuna again. All we have to do is burn prograde, I think. Probably be best. And that's the end of our fuel. And we're on escape. Full escape away from Duna now. But while we are here, we can do the Science Junior. All right, transmit that data. Okay, there you have it. That took a while. And this thing is just going to stay in in uh, orbit around the sun. It's going to end up in orbit around the sun and stick around there. We've now got almost 250 science to spend. Uh, let's let's take a look at what we can do with our funds in our science now. So just as a quick recap, uh, when I initially did the home and transfer, I really should have boosted myself up to an orbit close to Dunas. I think we would have ended up with a lot more fuel left over if I had done that in the first place and probably taken less time. As it is, we took seven years. <laughs> seven years to meet up with Duna. That is not intentional. That is not the way it's supposed to be. Tracking station. Upgrade cost 280000 Wow. Patch conics visible on, visible on map. Hold on a sec. Let's take a look at the, what we got going here. Ah, those decouplers would be helpful. Well, let's finish this tier off, huh? Just finish that off so that we see all the connections. 2.5 meter parts there. More 2.5 meter parts. Airplane parts. Thermometer. Thermometer could be good. Oh, processing lab, not so much. Not the way I do things usually. We could send a thermometer out to places. Yeah. And I'll unlock that right now. I usually like to skip her, but I don't think we're there yet. We've barely started using side boosters and uh, fuel flow into the center stack. So I'll hold off on that right now. We've got some science buffer here. Okay. Now, that upgrade's going to cost a lot of funds. So technically we should be saving up for that. We've got all these sorts of things. I haven't really done a satellite contract yet. I haven't planted a flag on the moon yet. Got a lot of stuff here. Science data from space around Duna. Okay, well we can do that as well because we're going to be doing that anyway. We're going to be sending another Duna mission. I'll try and do it the proper way. Okay, so let's say we've got those and I will unlock this. So next time I'll show how to do it with patch conics. So uh, with that, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.